Okay, good. So um, I will talk about proteogenomics. So um, that's when we take proteomics data and combine it with, uh, with genomics data. And um, some of you have probably already uh, heard either me or others talk about this a little bit, but uh, there are a lot of um, aspects that one uh, uh, needs to uh, think about. And there are lots of uh, also opportunities on uh, how to do that. Um, but if we start with uh, just looking at, let's see. Oh, there it is, yeah. This was just a little delay. Um, so if we look just at a few genes, and uh, um, in, if we have measured these genes at different levels, so both at DNA, RNA, uh, protein, and uh, uh, protein modifications, we can then see what's the relationship between these uh, uh, different uh, measurements. And this will, what we will see is that this will uh, be very different for uh, different genes. And also it will be very different uh, for, uh, when, uh, for different types of samples. So if we start with uh, looking at um, breast tumors, for example, and we look at the, the gene uh, ERBB2. Um, then if we compare uh, the level of the DNA, so the copy number of the gene uh, with the level of the transcript, we see that there is um, some correlation, meaning that if we have uh, an increased copy number of the gene, uh, often uh, the uh, transcript level is higher. It's not a perfect correlation, but it's, uh, it's still uh, uh, quite a dramatic effect. And uh, of course, what we see here is that there are in essence two uh, groups, if we look at from the uh, point of view of copy numbers, so one group where uh, we have the normal number of copies of the gene that is uh, two, um, and we have a group where uh, uh, there are more copies uh, of the gene. Um, so, uh, so that's again, so remember the context is breast cancer and it's the gene ERBB2. Um, and of course, we know that uh, this group that has where the ERBB2 is. Uh, amplified, uh, we have a, and have a higher copy number, uh, those uh, we can have a targeted treatment to um, that uh, targets uh, ERBB2. Um, so, um, but if we continue and look at uh, the correlation, so this is uh, RNA here on the x-axis now and protein on the y-axis. We see that we have quite a strong uh, correlation uh, when we have more uh, RNA, we also have more protein. Uh, and finally, if we look at uh, protein and uh, uh, one of phosphorylation site, we also see that uh, there is uh, an even stronger um, correlation. So again, so this is, uh, we see in the, uh, in the case of breast cancer, there is a very much uh, a, a, a correlation between all these different levels of measurements. But then if we look at the same uh, gene uh, for, uh, oops, what did that, uh, for, let me just move this panel. Um, if you look at uh, the same now uh, for ovarian cancer, we see that, first of all, there are no changes in, uh, uh, so it, again, it's the same gene, ERBB2, there are no changes in copy number and almost no variation in, uh, uh, in RNA levels. So if we compare it's the same scale here, you see that uh, RNA levels vary quite a bit, but here they're uh, very tightly uh, regulated. And uh, so this is, uh, in this case, we have actually 77 tumors in the breast cancer case and here uh, 174. Um, and uh, so, but then if we look at the protein RNA correlation, we see that 
even though there is almost no variation in uh, the RNA level of, uh, of the gene, there's quite a large range of protein levels. Um, very, um, I mean, quite comparable. The range in breast cancer is slightly larger, but it's still very comparable uh, ranges we see. And then if we look at the same phosphorylation site, um, here, there is no correlation between the protein levels uh, and the phosphorylation levels. And if we go in and look at uh, different genes one by one here, um, we see that we can see, sometimes we see high correlation, sometimes we don't. So that it's definitely, there is uh, a lot of um, uh, regulation that is not uh, that is done on the uh, protein level, and this regulation comes both from uh, translational regulation, but also from degradation. That the uh, the speed of degradation is uh, very different for uh, RNA and protein. And so, one example of that uh, that we can see now. So, if we look at uh, correlation at different levels between pairs of genes. So again, we, we're continuing with ERBB2 and looking at how it's correlated with GRB7. So in this case, we see that these two uh, genes are highly correlated, both the DNA, RNA, and protein levels. And this uh, correlation is driven by uh, changes in uh, copy numbers. So uh, ERBB2 uh, uh, we saw before that we had copy number changes um, and GRB7 is uh, uh, located very close on the genome, uh, on the same chromosome in a uh, uh, very close. Uh, so when we have uh, a, a copy number change in ERBB2, that will al almost always also be a copy number change in GRB7. Um, so, so here we see uh, that they're highly correlated at all, but uh, if we compare now ERBB2 to ERBB4, you see that ERBB4 is uh, in a different part of the uh, uh, genome, so it's not correlated on the DNA level, and there is really not much correlation on the RNA level, but still we see that it's highly correlated uh, on the protein level. Um, and this is very uh, common for um, pairs of genes that are uh, working together in uh, uh, protein complexes. And uh, one um, explanation for that, why this could happen is that um, the, uh, the proteins that are in the complex um, are uh, uh, much, uh, will be degraded much slower. So when we have a few, uh, some cop, uh, uh, changes in uh, uh, transcription and uh, production of proteins, um, but the pair that uh, it's together with in the, or uh, in the, could be also a multi-protein complex. Um, if the one gets overproduced, then it, uh, the extra copies will de get degraded. So this has been observed in many different um, uh, contexts. Um, so. Um, Often uh, we try to uh, develop uh, uh, signatures. So uh, uh, we try to develop uh, sort of groups of proteins that uh, um, uh, one can use to uh, uh, say something about how the patient should be treated. And so one uh, very well-known example in breast cancer is this uh, PAM50 uh, signature. So this is 50 genes that are um, uh, used to subtype uh, breast cancer into uh, whether it's uh, HER2, basal, luminal A, and luminal B. Um, so, so usually these, uh, the way that these uh, uh, signatures work is that we have groups of, so this, uh, the plot here shows both on the, the X and Y axis, the, the different uh, genes. So we have uh, ERBB2 is down here and here. So that's why the diagonal all have perfect correlations because we're comparing uh, the genes to themselves. But then we um, uh, look at the correlation uh, uh, 
across uh, all the genes against all. So what we see here, for example, is this dark uh, uh, purple square is a, a group of genes that are very highly uh, correlated with each other, but not perfectly. And that's something that we uh, often uh, um, uh, lo look for in uh, these signatures. So we have this variation, but then together uh, they will uh, sort of point in roughly the same uh, direction. And then we have um, other groups that are internally pretty well correlated, but anti-correlated with uh, the, the first group. So we're going to come back to this, how one actually finds uh, these, um, uh, uh, these signatures. Um, so for example, just to, to so what, what we looked at before, we looked at ERBB2 and GRB7, which is here. So that's, uh, so as we saw, they're very, uh, quite highly correlated. So, um, uh, we've talked a lot in this course about um, uh, how to measure proteins. And now I'm just going to give you a little bit uh, uh, more information about how we sequence uh, uh, DNA and RNA, because that's the kind of comparisons that we're going to uh, make. And you probably, I'm going to go through it fast, because you probably know uh, quite a bit about this already. Um, but uh, so, there are several different methods. The only one I'm going to uh, mention here is uh, uh, the one that uh, is right now most widely used, uh, which is uh, 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 sequencing by synthesis and uh, which gives us short uh, sequence reads. And it's a company called Illumina that has uh, developed this uh, technology. So you start out here with uh, genomic DNA that's extracted. Then you mechanically share it into smaller pieces. So um, a few hundred uh, base pairs. It depends on uh, the how long you want to sequence, but uh, probably nowadays it's uh, the fragment size is uh, slightly larger than 200, more like 500 maybe, and. Uh, of course, since it's mechanical sharing, it's not going to end up being exactly this size, but it's quite a wide uh, distribution of sizes that we um, get. But and usually we select out a range around uh, uh, the, the, the sequence size that we want. And then what is done is that uh, uh, we attach adapters and then finally deposit these on uh, a surface and then uh, uh, multiply. So each uh, of these will be separated on the surface, but then we have many copies of the same uh, sequence uh, together. And then uh, the sequencing happens uh, by uh, synthesizing. So we have the uh, primers, and then we have um, uh, fluoro the four bases with different fluorophores. Um, and then they will uh, 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 attach to the, uh, when we have the, the corresponding base um, uh, in the template strand. Um, and then we, uh, the uh, machine will uh, take a picture of the surface and then in the different spots we'll see different uh, colors. And then the um, fluorophores are uh, removed and then uh, the next base um, is added on. So we get then um, a series of pictures with uh, where in each spot we have different colors so we can read off the sequence. So uh, the data then looks like this. We have these images and we have, uh, and we see that in different spots um, we have um, the different colors, and then uh, we, we cont as we do the synthesis one base at a time, we, we then take a different picture and then read off the, um, uh, the sequence. So we get intensities, and then from that we get reads. Um, and uh, we get also reads with uh, a quality measure for each base. And so this part, going from the images to 
intensities to uh, reads. This is very well uh, developed uh, and uh, uh, most people, we don't worry about this. Um, and uh, that's uh, as opposed to in mass spectrometry where still the identification is uh, still uh, uh, a question how to uh, do it well, even though we uh, uh, know it pretty well, but it's still not as uh, uh, well worked out as uh, here with sequencing. And then we do alignment and the alignment is the main uh, question is how fast we can do it. Um, if we can, uh, and, and that's what people have worked out different uh, um, approaches to really do this uh, fast. Because we have, uh, I mean, first of all, when we have a reference genome, the reference genome is quite large. And then we have, we usually in a typical run, uh, generate many millions of reads and we need to find where they um, uh, align best to the reference genome. And also uh, with uh, taking it into account errors, because there are, we have, uh, there is some uh, uh, errors that are uh, included, even though it's uh, pretty, uh, high quality, we still have to, we don't want to throw away um, every read that has uh, uh, an error in it. Um, and then the other thing is that we don't, often we uh, have a reference, but actually the, uh, the genome of the uh, either person or uh, organism that we sequence is not exactly uh, the same as the reference. So, so that's why we, um, uh, need to uh, take into account differences. So uh, there are two ways mainly to do uh, this. One is, so we have these uh, short reads and usually we have, nowadays we have paired and sequencing. So we have, let's say a fragment that's 500 base pairs. And then on each end, we have sequenced 150 base pairs. And then we wanna, you almost, the most common thing is that we align to the genome, but uh, we can also do de novo assembly where we don't have a reference, but we just um, try to fit all the uh, the reads together in the most uh, uh, in the most optimal way. And this is something that uh, um, is, of course, much more uh, computer intensive. Um, and uh, so it's much easier if we have uh, a reference that we can work with. So let's have a look at a few examples of data. So here, this is now uh, showing chromosome four, and we're looking at the, the region here that's marked with the red um, uh, line. And uh, here uh, it's uh, showing this region uh, and here we have a gene called uh, UBA6, and these uh, blue uh, squares are the, um, the exons. Um, and uh, then in between are the, uh, the introns. So here we see from this RNA-seq data that, uh, and also here is the overall intensity of where most reads are aligned, and here we see uh, the reads are shown, but of course there are many more reads that are not shown that would continue. So this is just a, uh, some, uh, but here this uh, uh, column here, uh, in this row here shows the overall intensity. And we see, what we see is that we have these peaks that corresponds with the exons. So it's very, uh, 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 in this case, it's a very nice example that we, we really mostly get our reads aligned to the, to the uh, exons. So, so, but as you see, there are some reads aligning to the, the, the introns. Um, and uh, uh, so the question is always, are these just uh, errors and misalignments or is this um, really uh, something real? Um, so here, if we zoom in, to one exon, we see that we have a lot of reads 
um, and this is just a few of them. Uh, if we look at two um, exons next to each other, we see that they both have very good coverage. And then we have a lot of um, reads that start in one exon and then continue in the other one. Um, so this will give us a very good uh, readout of uh, um, showing that this is actually the, the really the exon structure. Now, sometimes it doesn't look that nice. So this is another example where we have uh, several exons here, but um, there, first of all, some of these exons, there is very little uh, evidence for that they're uh, correct and then we have a lot of noise. So we can also have this situation, which is uh, of course not um, uh, uh, so ideal. And of course you can imagine that um, when we try to use this to quantify uh, uh, gene expression on the RNA level, it's, uh, it uh, turns out to be quite uh, 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 inaccurate. So um, another thing that we often have is bias is uh, for example if we have <coughs> um, degraded RNA and uh, we do uh, poly A enrichment then we often get that the uh, three prime end we get much more coverage of the exons than um, in the five prime end. And as you see here, it's, uh, there is a quite a big difference. Um, and uh, ideally we want to have um, quite a uh, flat distribution, but often it's, it's difficult to get complete, but, but this just shows the normalized distance along transcripts over the whole genome. And, uh, and this is a reasonably good case while we can have both three prime and five prime bias. And of course, that will also uh, affect uh, the quantitation in uh, uh, a way that's really difficult to, um, uh, to anticipate, especially if we have that certain samples are uh, de more degraded than others that, and we do that comparison. So, that, so these are important things to include in the first step of um, uh, looking at the quality uh, of, uh, of one's um, RNA-seq data. Then, of course, we're often very interested in mutations. So this just shows one example. Uh, we have quite a few reads in this region. Um, and we see that in this position, uh, while the reference has a, a G, in our sample, we have a T. And this is uh, uh, important in a lot of contexts. Uh, uh, we have looked at this quite a bit in, uh, in cancer, where uh, these kinds of, if these are uh, somatic mutations, then uh, they could be uh, uh, quite important. But the other thing to observe on this plot is that we have these uh, single reads that are uh, uh, different. Uh, than uh, the other reads and the, uh, uh, the reference sequence. So then the question is, does that, is that an error? Or is that, for example, that um, a few percent of our uh, uh, tumor, uh, of, our, of the cells in the tumor have this mutation? So, so people have worked a lot on developing algorithms that can, um, uh, uh, distinguish between uh, these cases. And it's not easy to, um, uh, to, to know when, uh, how to set the thresholds uh, in this. Because the other thing that often different regions of the genome will have uh, very different coverage when we do sequencing. Uh, so we have to take into account that we have in the given region, we measure a certain number of uh, reads that align there. We have uh, errors in the sequencing. We might have uh, some errors in the alignment. Um, and then we have, uh, in the case of tumors, 
uh, also that we have heterogeneity. So maybe an important mutation only is in 10% of the tumors. Um, so this, all, all these things lead to that there are um, quite a lot of disagreements between uh, different methods for detecting mutations. So one typical approach there is um, to run several uh, uh, detec uh, 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 variant detection algorithms. And then let's say, for example, you could run three uh, detection algorithms and say that you believe in the ones, uh, the mutations that were detected that are uh, at least two algorithms out of the three detected. So, um, but uh, still, uh, uh, there are still quite different uh, results that you get uh, when you um, have different um, uh, approaches to this. Um, then another thing that we're interested in is alternative splicing. And there uh, we have, so this is one example where uh, this gene, have, we, we're just showing four exons. And we have the main uh, piece of evidence here for most of these reads is that the first exon uh, is connected to the fourth one here. And we skipped the uh, number two and three. That's most of these we see that we have reads going from uh, this exon uh, all the way here. But we also have um, examples, although at much lower count, of when uh, uh, our transcript starts at exon two or at exon three. Um, the other thing is novel expression. So uh, this we looked at this example before. Um, and uh, we see that, for example, there seems to be an exon here. Uh, there's quite a bit of evidence for that. Um, although there is no, in our uh, annotation uh, gene, in our gene model, there is no uh, evidence for that. Okay, so now this, these are the kinds of things that we see. Uh, both in when we sequence DNA and when we sequence RNA. So then the question is, can we observe these variants in the proteome? Um, so uh, the data that uh, I'm going to mostly show uh, is from this uh, uh, NCI-funded consortium that's called the uh, CPTAC. So that stands for Clinical Proteomics Tumor Analysis Consortium. And uh, we are one of the data analysis centers for, uh, uh, for CPTAC. And so uh, the consortium has two goals. One is to look at uh, treatment naive tumors and understand the uh, proteogenomic complexity. And the other th uh, goal is uh, uh, to uh, look at how we can uh, better, uh, uh, how we can improve treatment by using uh, uh, the combination of uh, genomic and proteomic methods to uh, better predict treatment response, look at resistance and uh, toxicity, uh, and so on. So, and uh, the, the consortium started out with looking at uh, uh, tumors from TCGA. So uh, TCGA had leftover uh, tumors and uh, uh, about uh, 100 tumors for each of colon, breast and ovarian were first analyzed. Um, but then uh, CPTEC went on to do uh, a, their own collection of um, an additional 100 tumors, again, for colon, breast, and ovarian, and then also moved on to uh, other tumors. And uh, the, uh, the strategy is to do first the discovery study with 100 tumors, and then a follow-up uh, uh, confirmatory study with an additional 100. And uh, right now, uh, there has been publications on um, endometrial, uh, kidney, and uh, lung adenocarcinoma has uh, also just been accepted. And, uh, and now uh, the consortium is going on and working with um, uh, and doing the same kind of analysis for uh, 
um, also uh, 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 GBM um, and pediatric uh, uh, brain tumors um, and uh, lung squamous cell carcinoma uh, and pancreatic and uh, 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 head and neck cancer. Um, so that's so. There's more and more uh, data coming out where we will have both um, the uh, the genomic uh, analysis and the proteomic. So typically there will be uh, whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing, DNA methylation, um, uh, microRNA, uh, RNA seq, and then uh, proteomics and uh, uh, phosphoproteomics and uh, um, uh, now more and more acetylation uh, data is coming out also. Um, so the, we've looked at this already, but the, the general CPTAC approach is to uh, use uh, isobaric labeling and it's the TMT 10 plex. So that means that it's nine samples um, that are uh, uh, make nine tumor samples are mixed together, and one uh, uh, sample with um, uh, a, a, a standard sample that's uh, used to uh, normalize the different batches. And typically, the standard sample is a, um, a mixture of uh, many tumors. And then there's a, a pre-fractionation uh, into lots of different fractions using uh, basic reverse phase chromatography. And then uh, about 5% of the sample is used for proteome analysis. And typically uh, 24 fractions are used there. Um, and then each of these fractions is then analyzed with uh, um, LCMSMS for uh, use, uh, two hour uh, chromatography runs. And then 95% is used for um, uh, PTM analysis and uh, usually phosphopeptide uh, analysis is done first, 12 fractions, and then additional, for example, uh, lysine acetylation is also uh, analyzed. Um, so uh, then if we go back now to look at um, can we observe these uh, changes in the, in the genome uh, in, uh, uh, in the proteome, um, then of course we, we remember that we have our protein sequence database, but if our uh, our peptide is not in the uh, database, we will not find it. So then the idea is that if we uh, use the uh, sequencing data uh, to make a sample specific database, uh, we should be uh, then able to see uh, uh, the, uh, the mutations and the alternative splice forms uh, in, the, in our sample. So um, now the way we then create these tumor specific databases is that we just uh, enumerate all the possible uh, changes in the protein sequence that the uh, genomic uh, uh, changes can lead to. So for example, we can have a, a single uh, mutation that will lead to a single um, amino acid change. We can have different alternative splice forms. So for example, here in the, our uh, the genome annotations, we have three exons. So exon one is connected to two, which is connected to three. But then in the RNA-seq data, we might observe that exon one is connected directly to exon three, um, the skipping exon two. Uh, we can see other things. So for example, the end of exon one could be connected to the middle of exon three, uh, to an intron, to an intergenic region. So there are all sorts of possibilities. We can have uh, regions of the genome that are not at all annotated that are, we see uh, these uh, uh, evidence of connection from the RNA-seq data. 
and we can of course uh, see uh, fusion genes. So uh, here is a, an example of a single uh, base change. In this case, it's from uh, a, a G to an A. Um, and uh, so here we have a valine. And then if we, uh, because of the change, it will be an isoleucine instead. So um, uh, these are then, if we include this new peptide in the database, we have a, a potential of um, observing it. We can have other things. We can also have, in this case, for example, a single uh, nuclear ch change will lead to this tyrosine be converted to a, um, a stop codon. And these, of course, is a very dramatic change. And um, again, uh, because of the stop codon here, this whole part of the protein will not uh, be expressed. And most likely this uh, part will be uh, degraded. But again, it's very, from the data, it's quite difficult to say anything about these cases because it's negative evidence, so things disappear and they can disappear for all sorts of reasons. So that's uh, um, something that uh, we, we have to take into account, but often we can't say very much about it. Here is another case where we have a stop codon that is uh, uh, converted to a uh, uh, glutamic acid. So we get a little bit longer uh, sequence until there is another stop codon here. And so this adds uh, more sequence that uh, we potentially can observe. So um, how much of this do we see? So this uh, is an example from the first, um, one of the CP, first CPTAC studies where um, uh, the consortium looked at 105 uh, breast tumors. So um, if we look at the, this Venn diagram here, we see that uh, there are about a little bit more than 36,000 DNA variants. So DNA variants in this case, so the way we count them is that these are variants in coding regions that lead to uh, changes in amino acids um, and that these are in triptych peptides that are of uh, uh, a size that they can uh, potentially at least be detected in mass spectrometry. So we remove the uh, uh, peptides that have less than seven um, amino acids, and I think uh, it was <coughs> the ones that are larger than 25 maybe, because the, uh, the uh, probability for detecting them goes uh, down as they uh, become larger. Um, so, so these are 36,000 DNA variants, and then we have uh, 48,000 RNA variants. So this is the DNA variants we get from uh, the exome sequencing data and the RNA variants from um, the uh, RNA-seq data. So as you see, there is not a perfect overlap. In general, it's considered, I mean, the quality of the um, variants from the exome sequencing data is higher. Um, and, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, then if we look at the proteins, um, we get the, uh, this orange um, uh, one. So the, we only see about 3,000 of these. So it's only about, in this case, about 4% um, of the variants that we see. And of course, this doesn't come as a surprise because uh, proteome coverage is, we know, is limited. So even if we can identify a lot of protein, and this is very, was very deep proteomics because uh, we did uh, extensive prefractionation um, in 24 fractions, and uh, we were able to identify uh, and quantify about 10,000 proteins per tumor, but still, um, even then, we only see even uh, we only see a few peptides for those proteins. So there are large parts of, of many proteins that we don't observe, and that's what we see here: that we get 
still quite uh, limited uh, coverage. So these are the, uh, when we look at signa, uh, single nucleotide variants that lead to single uh, amino acid uh, uh, changes. So if we look at the uh, splice junctions, so now these are splice junctions that we see from um, RNA-seq. Uh, so we see a lot of those. Um, again, the RNA-seq data in this case was quite deep. Um, and, but again, here now, we only see very few of these uh, uh, in the proteome. So now this is a, a small fraction of a percent. Um, and uh, so there could be many uh, uh, explanations for that, but probably a large effect is that many of these uh, uh, never make it into being proteins. Even though we observe them at the RNA level, um, if they uh, get uh, translated, the, the, those uh, proteins, most of them will be uh, degraded very fast because they don't uh, fold uh, properly. So, so this was now in the context of tumors where we um, didn't see that many uh, variants. But another uh, sort of area where we can uh, apply this is to look at antibodies. Because antibodies also, um, we're not uh, able to go from the genome very easily because uh, uh, their uh, antibodies go through several um, uh, stages of recombination. So one is that uh, we have the VDGA recombination, uh, we can, which can give rise to many different uh, 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 possible uh, antibody sequences. But then in addition to that, um, it also goes through uh, somatic hypermutation. So the relationship between the actual sequence of the antibody and what we have in the genome is uh, not easy to um, uh, it's not easy to go from uh, the, uh, uh, the genome and predict what are the possible uh, antibody sequences. And, and one thing to remember here is that we do need to have the exact sequence in the database to be able to identify it with uh, proteomics. So um, uh, one project that uh, I was involved in was to uh, do antibody sequencing and especially doing antibody sequencing for uh, producing uh, um, uh, reagents. So there we actually uh, uh, went use llamas because llamas and uh, camels, they have, in addition to uh, the, uh, the antibodies that we have, which has both the uh, um, heavy chain and light chain, they also have single chain antibodies. And these, the variable part is uh, really small, so it's 15 kilodaltons, and it's very, uh, uh, behaves very well, it folds well and is stable. Um, and uh, so, so the idea is that if one can sequence these, then one can make uh, very stable um, uh, reagents. So um, this shows the, um, the pipeline for it. So first uh, you take a llama and immunize it um, and uh, uh, then take both bone marrow uh, and, and then also the serum. So there are these two parallel um, uh, workflows. Uh, so one here, the bone marrow is used for uh, targeted sequencing of the uh, single chain variable uh, region and uh, to produce uh, a database of um, presumably as much as possible of the, um, uh, the antibody diversity that the llama has ever um, uh, produced or against any uh, infection that it has been uh, uh, exposed to. So, but these include also the ones that we uh, 
uh, antibodies against antigen that was used for immunizing. And so uh, it's uh, uh, then uh, the, the uh, single chain variable region is amplified and sequenced um, and then uh, assembled and to make uh, a peptide sequence library. And then, so again, this will give us a library that uh, uh, doesn't have really much specificity, but it's uh, the whole uh, antibody repertoire. But then uh, from the serum, uh, we first uh, select out the uh, single chain regions, and uh, then we also uh, uh, look for uh, which ones specifically bind to our antigen. And then we uh, sequence these with mass spectrometry and then search uh, the database that was created from the bone marrow sequencing. And then we can assemble these and uh, get the full sequence and finally uh, uh, produce these, when we have the sequence, we can then uh, produce it in E. coli. So this is, so the DNA library construct, so in this case we use MySeq, so which will give you paired reads uh, of uh, uh, about 300 base pairs each with quite a large overlap, uh, and, but the quality is very poor uh, at the end of each read, but the nice thing is that um, where the uh, sequences are very poor for one, the sequences, uh, it, the quality is pretty good for the other read. So we can then uh, put them together. So this shows the quality of the read one, which goes down at the end dramatically, and of read two, which also goes down. But then if we uh, merge them, we get high quality for the whole uh, region. Um, and this shows the distribution. So we have peaks here at every uh, three nucleotides corresponding to uh, an amino acid uh, difference between these. Um, so we get a lot of high quality uh, sequences of the full length uh, of the variable region. And then it's pretty straightforward to uh, buy uh, uh, the uh, DNA sequence and uh, uh, clone it and uh, purify it. Um, and uh, uh, then here just, sh just shows an example where we uh, made these uh, nanobodies against uh, GFP using this method. So here is the fluorescence from the GFP itself. And here is from the homemade uh, antibody. Uh, and as you can see, we can get very similar uh, <coughs> uh, pictures from the uh, two. Um, so um, here one can, uh, and the, the nice thing is that one doesn't get just one uh, uh, sequence, but in most cases one gets uh, several uh, high quality uh, sequences. Okay, any questions on that? So how are we doing on time? Okay, so we have uh, about an hour. So I'm gonna continue. Um, do you guys want a short break or should I continue straight? Um, you could just continue, but whatever everyone else wants. Okay. You yeah. can continue. Okay, good. I'll continue. So um, now uh, we, I've talked about uh, the, how we can uh, use this combination of uh, genomic analysis and proteomic analysis to uh, identify sequences. So both in tumors and in uh, um, uh, for antibodies. Um, and uh, this, uh, so this is a, uh, definitely one, one part of proteogenomics. So the other part is that we talked a little bit more about in the beginning is that we can measure the quantities of uh, different, so we can measure the copy number of a gene, we can measure uh, 
the uh, transcript levels, we can measure the protein levels and uh, um, the mod levels of the modified proteins. And then we can uh, either compare these or um, uh, try to integrate them in different ways. Um, so one uh, strategy that we uh, are uh, like to do, sorry, so my battery is running low. So I gotta, I'm gonna, let me just plug this in one second. Okay, so, uh, yeah, um, so, um, so one method that we um, have been using quite a bit is independent component analysis. So um, the idea with independent component analysis and what, was it, what it was developed uh, for initially was to um, look at mixed signals and uh, um, try to tease them apart. So the classical example for independent component analysis is that if you are in a room where there are several conversations going on, um, if you listen, they will overlap. Uh, but uh, uh, an independent component analysis then was uh, used to uh, separate out these. Um, into different uh, uh, channels. So in our case, if we look at the tumor, um, we, we could think of that there are different uh, pathways that affect uh, our uh, tumors. And this, the signal that we measure, of course, is a mixture of these different uh, uh, pathways. But uh, uh, so the idea is that with uh, independent component analysis, we can um, then separate uh, out these. Um, so um, uh, the way uh, we do it, so we, we, we have our data. So we have uh, columns are different samples um, and uh, then rows are different genes. Um, so um, what we then uh, want to separate out is uh, different signatures. So each, uh, and then the mixing matrix, how much each signature correspond, uh, uh, contributes to each sample. So now uh, this is a, a matrix multiplication and this uh, can be solved uh, in uh, different ways. Um, and uh, so what we, uh, and it, uh, uh, the med there's not an exact uh, solution, but we, well, the way we do it is we start at some uh, point and then uh, usually a random starting point and then uh, optimize uh, our, uh, uh, to find the, uh, the best solution. So what we could end up with is that, uh, and what we do end up with is that some of um, the, uh, uh, these signatures are stable. So if we pick different um, uh, starting uh, points, we will end up with the same, with similar signatures uh, and some signatures are less stable. So, and then the way we, we can use, in this case, usually two different measures. So um, in this case, we ran these uh, optimizations 50 times. And then we looked at how consistent these clusters are. So in how many of the runs did we actually get the clusters? So we have quite a few where we are, that are very reproducible and um, over and over again with different starting points, we end up with the same clusters. But then there are others that are much less um, uh, uh, reproducible. So that's the x-axis here, so how many when we run the optimization, uh, how many times do we get the, the, the signature? The other thing is um, how compact it is. So how similar is the signature every um, time? 
And so this can be illustrated. So this is, uh, if we show it in two dimensions, so this is a T-SNE plot, uh, we see that some of these are uh, very uh, uh, compact clusters, uh, while others here in the middle are uh, much more uh, spread out. So, um, so that's another thing. So if we, we take these two uh, measures as to see which quality, and then we do some kind of selection of what is the um, uh, considered a good uh, cluster. So, so far, this is a, a completely non-supervised method. We, we take the, uh, the data, uh, either uh, we do uh, look at the proteome, phosphoproteome, or um, uh, transcriptome, and we get these signatures. So, so far we haven't introduced any other uh, information that's specific to, um, uh, to, uh, to the uh, samples. But then the next step is uh, we, do, we correlate these signatures with different clinical variables. So in this case, in uh, breast cancer, we, we had a few different, it's mainly subtypes and uh, um, uh, some uh, uh, receptor status that we correlated it with. So, uh, so, we see, uh, so we see that sometimes, for example, this one, the cluster number four here correlates uh, really well with um, uh, luminal A. And it also is a very reproducible uh, uh, cluster. Um, so um, then we can see what are the proteins that are in this cluster that are very, um, uh, that are strongly contributing to that uh, signature. And in this case, we see that um, they're all cell cycle genes. Um, the ones that, and we see that here with luminal A, we see that a lot of them are uh, negatively correlated. So one thing that uh, is actually well known is that in luminal A, these cell cycle genes are downregulated. Um, so this is one way uh, of uh, finding uh, signatures. Um, there are, of course, many other ways, but um, it's often the case uh, we try to uh, find these signatures that then characterize a subset of these tumors that then can be uh, treated in, uh, in a different way. So um, the other thing, so now if we look at the correlation of this uh, signature, uh, of the genes that are uh, strong. You can't see the genes, but that's not uh, the point. The main thing is that we have these blocks of uh, uh, correlated genes. So in this case, we have two blocks. So one, uh, this, they're uh, quite highly correlated with each other. This is another block that's a little bit less strongly correlated with each other, but the two blocks are anti-correlated with uh, each other. So that's, uh, that's something that we see for most of the, um, uh, our signatures. Um, so then the question is, why use independent component analysis and not something that's more commonly used uh, like uh, principal component analysis? So um, the, uh, the main reason which we try to illustrate here is that uh, and we've seen this, this is uh, for breast cancer, but we've seen this for other uh, data also, is that principal component analysis uh, does find, uh, so, uh, have highly correlated uh, um, uh, principal components with uh, uh, some of the clinical variables, uh, but often it is uh, one or very few of the components that are dominating this correlation. So in this case, it's mainly component two that uh, uh, has the uh, most of the correlation. While in independent component analysis, we get a much more uh, uh, spreading out and there are more um, 
we have different components that uh, uh, correlate with different clinical variables. And oh yeah, so one thing to mention is that, so principal component analysis looks at variance, as you know, um, over, so it's, uh, it looks at first which direction in this multidimensional space has uh, the largest variance and then which one has the second vari largest variance. Um, so independent component analysis looks at the uh, uh, non-Gaussian part of the distribution. And actually the first step in independent component analysis is to first um, do a principal component analysis and subtract out that, those components. So if you have a perfectly Gaussian distributions, uh, of your uh, errors in your data, then independent component analysis will not work at all. Um, then uh, all the signal will be taken care of by uh, principal component analysis. So we have to have these uh, 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 nonlinear uh, contributions. So um, another example of uh, proteogenomics that we looked at was um, looking at uh, patient-derived xenografts. And uh, so these are, uh, when you take a human tumor and put it into uh, a mouse and, uh, it, uh, uh, and you uh, uh, grow it in the mouse. And then the, the nice thing with this is that you can then do all sorts of experiments. You can put the same tumor in several mice and then uh, uh, try different drug treatments, for example. Um, but of course, it's not, um, you're studying the tumor in, uh, uh, in a, not in a, the right environment. Um, but the, the one advantage is, is that you can uh, distinguish between what is the tumor and what is the microenvironment. Um, so that's uh, what we looked at here. And uh, so uh, what we uh, can distinguish, we can see uh, how many uh, proteins, which proteins are human and which proteins are mouse. Of course, a lot of peptides is the mouse and protein has pretty similar sequences. About a third of the peptides we have to throw away um, because we can't say whether it comes from a mouse or a human. Um, but still, quite a few, uh, one can still uh, uh, say which one. So um, the, uh, what we looked at here in this case is, uh, so we uh, did both, we had several different tumors um, the, from different uh, humans, and then each tumor we put into uh, several different mice. So we had both um, uh, intertumor and uh, intratumor. So that is um, when we had um, looked at human proteins, um, if there were uh, between different human tumors, looking at the, there was very little uh, correlation. Um, but if we looked at the same tumor put into different mice, in identical mice, we had quite a lot of correlation. As we would expect that it's the same tumor, we would want, uh, expect there would be quite a large correlation in the human. But what we also saw was that uh, the non-tumor proteins, so that mouse proteins from the microenvironment had not as high of a correlation, but still uh, much higher correlation than uh, we would expect. So, so the, the, what it seemed to be is that the tumor um, is uh, sort of educating the my, microenvironment and creating to some extent the microenvironment that it can uh, grow in well. So um, then this is another way of looking at it. So uh, here is when we look at the human proteins um, and uh, do uh, hierarchical clustering, we see that these are the three, uh, the, uh, the tumor, so these are the same tumor in three different mice, 
Uh, so we have seven different tumors, each in three different mice. So we see that uh, we get very good uh, segregation of, first of all, the, the biological replicate, but also of the subtypes. Um, and, but if we look at the mouse proteins, we get also uh, a surprisingly good uh, separation. So we can tell from the, just looking at the microenvironment which tumor uh, uh, it was. So um, then another thing that we've uh, looked at very much is to the uh, kinases in cancer. And uh, so there are many uh, uh, reasons to look at kinases. Also, a lot of known uh, kinases are uh, involved in the cancer progression. Um, and uh, there are also quite a lot of kinase inhibitors available um, uh, that uh, have been approved for some uh, therapies. So if one can, uh, sort of predict which um, uh, kinases uh, are uh, overly active in a given tumor, uh, then one could uh, repurpose these uh, kinase inhibitors potentially. So um, uh, what we, and here we look at uh, phosphoproteomic data and the idea is that uh, 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 kinase phosphorylation is a uh, good surrogate for uh, kinase activity. Um, so, and we apply uh, outlier analysis to this. So um, the way we do it is that for each uh, phosphocyte across all the samples, we find the distribution. And then we find uh, in, in a given tumor, which phosphocytes are uh, outliers. And then we can do this for um, DNA, RNA, and protein uh, levels also in addition to phospho uh, level. Um, so uh, the way that we have this, so here these, the columns are the different tumors and uh, the um, rows are different um, uh, measurements. So this a row could be a protein, uh, an RNA measurement, a, a copy number measurement, a phosphocyte measurement. And then we create this, the distribution across all the samples, and then we look for, uh, for outliers. Um, and so uh, then of course we wanna estimate uh, what, uh, uh, what we would get at the random so we can set thresholds. Um, and then for that, we do a random resampling. So we uh, just uh, uh, we scramble the, the, uh, the data um, to see how many outliers we would get uh, by chance. And then what we do is we do use this for cohort comparisons. Uh, <coughs> So we, uh, we often have, and these cohorts are based on different clinical variables usually. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, often we have, we compare a smaller group to a larger group. And uh, the uh, regular statistical analysis that we usually do um, works better when we have cohorts of similar sizes. And often when we have a small cohort and a larger cohort, what we end up with is that uh, we, we don't get, uh, um, uh, I mean, our power is very low. But for, for outlier analysis, it uh, uh, interestingly enough works uh, much better. And we can, even if we only have in one cohort, a few tumors, we can use it to, uh, to do a, a, a comparison. So uh, this first time we applied this to uh, uh, the CPTEC uh, uh, breast uh, study, and uh, so, for example, here we have um, 77 tumors, four different subtypes. And in this case, so if you look at ERBB2 again, 
and we look for outliers both in a copy number, transcript, protein, and phospho. We see that the um, HER2 enriched subtype, uh, we have usually very consistently ERBB2 uh, is, um, uh, uh, there's a copy number change, uh, the RNA is an outlier, protein is an outlier, and several phosphocytes are outliers. And then we see that some other, in the, especially in luminal B, there are a few tumors that show the same pattern. We also see it, CDK12 show very similar uh, uh, pattern as ERBB2, but then we also have another example, PAC1 in this case, where it uh, shows the same consistent uh, outlier uh, status for all the uh, omics levels, but for different uh, uh, tumors. And then also, so th there are actually only a few genes that show consistent outlier uh, status across all the uh, omics uh, uh, types. Um, but we have, we get, when we look at the phosphorylation data, we get a much uh, richer data. Um, and that's really where uh, we get most of uh, the, the interesting results that we get. Um, and, and what we also see is that uh, each tumor, even within the same subtype, show very different uh, um, uh, kinase outlier uh, status. So um, then these are just a few other examples. So uh, here we can uh, look at um, and the, the CMB high uh, uh, subtype in endometrial cancer, uh, which and looked for which are the uh, uh, the outliers there, and we can uh, uh, we have now applied this uh, uh, strategy to many different uh, uh, cancers, and uh, we we often uh, uh, see that it's uh, very. Uh, gives us very interesting results. Here is another example uh, from uh, pediatric brain cancer study where we uh, looked at, so these were uh, proteomics uh, subtypes that were uh, defined by the study. And then we can look for um, outliers in these um, uh, different subtypes. And we can see that some of the subtypes have similarities some of the subtypes might actually be two different groups um, and, and so on. So we can also use it to sort of um, evaluate um, if we uh, select some kind of subtype division, how um, good is that? So another thing that we, we applied this uh, outlier analysis to was to um, uh, look at uh, treatment. So this is a, uh, uh, <coughs> um, uh, was a drug called BKM120 uh, that was a, a PI3K inhibitor. Um, so here again we have um, patient derived xenografts. So we have two sensitive and two resistant and two that were somewhere in the middle. And uh, so we, we we then tried outlier analysis to, to see, and the, the, here it shows the treatment. So first it was a two hour treatment, 50 hour treatment, and uh, uh, both treatment and control. Um, so um, how do we approach uh, this with outlier analysis now? Um, we need a distribution. And in this case, we don't have a big enough distribution. We have six uh, uh, different uh, uh, tumors only. So we can't really, <coughs> but what we were able to do is are, uh, since these, these were all uh, basal uh, tumors. So what we did was to take the distribution from uh, the uh, uh, 19 basal um, TCJ tumors that we had. So we could, uh, and we showed that we could actually use this uh, distribution from another data set and uh, get uh, quite consistent results. So now 
if we do this uh, outline analysis, we see here now the tumors are ordered in how resistant they are. So the VIM2 and VIM12 down here <coughs> are the most resistant to the drug. And uh, we see that we get um, several of the, um, uh, uh, of the kinases are, uh, have outliers uh, uh, phosphorylation uh, for the resistant tumors. So then our collaborators took two of these based on the outline analysis and uh, uh, knocked them down in, a, uh, in this VIM12 cell line. Uh, that was the most resistant. Um, and when they knocked these two genes down, then uh, these, the cell lines went from being resistant to being sensitive to the drug. Um, so this is another uh, example where we use proteogenomic genomic analysis and especially outlier analysis to, um, to analyze the data. So this is a very simple approach. I mean, outlier analysis, you can hardly imagine a simpler uh, thing to just look at uh, what's uh, different from the larger group. Um, but it turns out that it's uh, very useful for many reasons. One is that um, it's very easy to tell uh, a clinician that, um, look, it looks like um, these two or three uh, kinases are much more active in this tumor than in uh, other tumors. Maybe it's worth um, adding a, uh, um, an inhibitor to them uh, to, in addition to the standard of care. Um, and uh, so it's very uh, 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 amenable to, um, uh, to improving treatment. Now, of course, this is very early days and uh, we still need to do a lot of uh, tests whether this is actually useful. Uh, but it, it definitely looks very uh, promising. Okay, so I have one more piece here. Um, shouldn't take too long. I'll uh, have a few more slides. So, so the last part, I want to show an example of how we uh, did uh, proteogenomic analysis of um, uh, mobile DNA. So um, uh, as you probably have heard, uh, a large part of our uh, genome comes from um, uh, sequences that can uh, uh, make copies of themselves. So uh, these are uh, uh, probably long, long time ago um, uh, where uh, came into our genome and then have been able to reproduce themselves. So roughly 45% of our genome comes from uh, these uh, mobile DNA elements. Now, most of them are mutated or truncated, so they're not mobile anymore, but at some point they were. And um, some of them, the, the one that we have looked at most is this uh, line one element, which is about 17% of the genome. So it's uh, an enormous number of um, copies uh, of, uh, of this. So, so that adds an extra uh, problem to the, to the analysis. So um, uh, the structure of it is pretty simple. So it's about 6,000 uh, base pairs long. It has a five prime UTR with uh, uh, a built-in promoter. Uh, and uh, it has one open reading frame that's called ORF1. Um, and, it has, uh, and then another one that's called ORF2. And then it has a poly A tail. Um, so uh, uh, then uh, the life cycle is the following. So um, we have uh, many, many copies of this. Uh, most of them are not functional, but there are about a hundred that have the full length. So including the uh, promoter in the five prime end, ORF1, ORF2, um, and the poly A tail. 
So, um, and it can be, they can be transcribed. Uh, they then uh, can be translated. And also uh, the uh, proteins, the ORF1 and ORF2 bind to its own DNA and sometimes to other, uh, sorry, uh, its own RNA and sometimes to other RNAs. Then this uh, ribonuclear particle gets imported into the nucleus. Um, the uh, ORF2 has uh, both an endonuclease um, uh, function, so it can uh, cut the, uh, the DNA and a reverse transcriptase functionality, so it can uh, make a DNA copy of its uh, RNA and insert itself uh, into a new site. So it can make uh, copies uh, of itself with an RNA intermediary. So um, we've been looking at this both at what transcription factors are binding and what transcription factors are needed, uh, looking at uh, transcript levels in tumors, uh, looking at, and also in normal uh, tissues, protein levels, protein interactions, because no, it's not only these two proteins that are needed, but also other uh, uh, cellular proteins that are used for this uh, uh, along the life cycle. Uh, then we're also looking at uh, novel insertions. Um, and uh, so, uh, for example, we, we developed uh, a, a pipeline to take ChIP-seq data and uh, uh, look at which ones were binding to uh, the line one. Uh, now, so the main thing here that adds uh, uh, problems is that we have these very many copies of uh, truncated. So, so we really need to be very careful with filtering reads. Um, because otherwise we get uh, very uh, 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 strange results. So, so that's really the, the key to getting uh, good looking at the transcription factor is how do we filter these uh, reads out. So then this shows an example. So this is MIC in a few different cell lines. So this, we have three different cell lines and uh, this here we have the line one. So this is the five prime UTR. Uh, ORF1 and ORF2 and the poly A, uh, the three prime UTR followed by the poly A tail. So what we see is that MIC, for example, binds very differently in, uh, uh, in these three different cell lines. So in the uh, green trace, we have three uh, large peaks in the five prime UTR. In the blue, we have uh, just mainly one peak and then in the orange, we, we actually don't have uh, uh, very distinct peaks there. But instead we have distinct peaks uh, in the five prime UTR. Um, so, and then for example, here is CTCF. And it actually turns out that uh, in many cell lines, MIC and CTCF have a very similar pattern, how they bind to it, uh, to line one. <laughs> And uh, so, so we looked closer at MIC and CTCF, and it, um, and now this is looking at um, correlation uh, with uh, line one uh, uh, protein levels, um, and looking at MIC and CTCF, and we see that uh, always CTCF is among the most correlated, while MIC. Uh, is uh, among the uh, least correlated. Um, and um, so then based on that, uh, one can uh, uh, then think about how this, uh, uh, what mechanism uh, there is for, <coughs> um, for the effect of these um, uh, transcription factors on, um, the, on line one expression. So then if we move on to uh, transcript levels, here we also have an issue that 
we can have, uh, if we find a read that maps to line one, it doesn't necessarily mean that it um, comes from uh, an active line one. So the one uh, that we're most interested in are these that um, come from when uh, the, uh, the transcription starts at uh, in the five prime end and then goes uh, to the end of the gene. Then we often have this run on when it continues and that's also fine. But um, what confuses the situation is that we have this passive co-transcription in both directions. Since we have so many copies, I think there are about 500,000 copies of, uh, uh, of truncated pieces of line one. Um, so, um, uh, Wilson McCarran, my lab, he developed uh, a way to um, try to, uh, first of all, tell where, uh, which uh, line one element uh, the transcription uh, came from. And also um, then uh, be able to separate out whether it's uh, uh, just passive co-transcription or whether it comes from a full length uh, uh, line one element. And so he uses a, uh, an EM algorithm so uh, to see which distribution of the reads is most consistent uh, with, the, with the data. So then when we have these uh, transcript levels, we were able to then uh, look at uh, how, uh, 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 what the uh, levels are of, um, uh, uh, of line one transcription in different tumors. And we see, so this is a, a log scale. So we see that some tumors, we get very high line one uh, expression, uh, while others uh, uh, we get uh, much lower. And uh, so, so that's uh, one thing. Uh, and it's important to do this with a method that can accu accurately um, separate this passive code transcription and the, uh, uh, the line one uh, expression of full length elements. Um, so um, this now shows for a few cell lines um, the, uh, uh, the origin where uh, line one uh, transcription comes from. And it's in many cases uh, dominated by a few loci. In some cases it's uh, a few more, but uh, it's not unusual that, especially this one, uh, uh, 22Q12-1 is, uh, is really dominating in, uh, in a lot of uh, cell lines and also in a lot of um, human tumors. We see this one here. And uh, we have, uh, especially for breast cancer, there is a very uh, strong preference for, for this uh, uh, expression from this location. Uh, while in endometrial cancer, we have a much larger distribution and not, uh, nothing is, no location is that dominating. So um, then if we go into the next step, which is to look at the proteins. Uh, sorry about this, the slide is a bit messed up here. Um, so here we are looking at uh, the columns are tumors. So here is our breast tumors and then here ovarian tumors. And these are different ORF1 peptides that we um, identify. Um, so, uh, so as we can see, we can get quite consistent uh, uh, ORF1 detection, and especially on the protein level, and uh, about 95% uh, we, were, we were able to, of the tumor, of the breast and ovarian tumors, we were able to find ORF1, and also uh, able to, to quantify it properly. And uh, the way that we, uh, uh, sort of make sure that we can quantify um, things well. So this is difficult to see, but um, 
these are different uh, the different peptides uh, both on the x and y axis and looking at how well uh, the the quantitation correlates with each other so using this uh, data uh, we could select out uh, a group of peptides that were highly correlated and that were observed in quite a few of the uh, of the samples um, so then we can look at um, correlation uh, between protein and RNA. Um, so this is now on the x-axis here for different tumors of breast, ovarian, colon, uh, kidney, and endometrial. Um, we have uh, uh, RNA as we measure it, and then uh, protein. Um, so uh, we see that for uh, some for like uh, endometrial cancer, we get a very high correlation. And for several other cancers, but for example, for kidney, we don't have uh, much of a, a correlation between RNA and protein. And we also have very low levels uh, in general. So then we talked about protein interactions in earlier classes. And here also we looked at uh, how proteins interact and we used, uh, um, again, iDIRT as we discussed before, where we uh, use uh, mixed tagged protein that's grown in light medium with the, uh, uh, the wild type protein in heavy medium and then do the immune isolation together to be able to tell between specific and non-specific interactors. And uh, here is just an illustration of that. These are um, 12 different um, experimental conditions to do the, um, uh, the pull downs. And see, uh, so this is now uh, an uh, pulling down ORF1. Uh, so here we see uh, that in this case, we only two proteins are significant uh, and we have a very high uh, so we, we, we washed it very extensively, but in other cases we get uh, lots of interactors. So this way we can tease out which are the really strong interactors and which are uh, the, the, the weaker ones. And, uh, uh, but, and get a, quite a full picture of what uh, uh, cellular proteins are needed for, um, uh, for, uh, for the life cycle of uh, line one. Then we also developed a method for detecting novel somatic mutations. And uh, so what we get usually, so if we have uh, novel mutations, we have uh, the human genome here um, and then an insertion uh, somewhere uh, at a certain location. But um, that uh, it makes it complicated because we are reference genome, we don't have this uh, insertion. So that's why we needed to develop uh, uh, a, uh, a sensitive targeted method. Um, so here uh, is uh, um, the idea is that we do targeted sequencing of um, a, uh, a small portion of the line one. Um, so uh, close to its three prime end and into the genome uh, to be able to uh, say where uh, this line one is inserted. So for example, here is some data. So here we have uh, a region on chromosome six and then here is the, our insertion and here is line one. Uh, so we just sequence, uh, tar do target sequencing here. So we get some sequences from the, just the genome then we get some bridging pair. So this is uh, one read is on the genome side, one on the line one side. And then we get some reads that are uh, bridging here. Uh, so this, so what we did was to develop uh, a machine learning algorithm that could take uh, these, this data um, and uh, uh, then predict whether there was an insertion there or whether it was just noise. So, and here is one 
example of a somatic mutation that we saw in, the, in an ovarian tumor, in the uh, one of the uh, uh, introns of BRCA1. Um, we saw uh, an insertion uh, here, and this shows the data. So we got just a few uh, reads that were bridging the insertions. We got a few more um, that were one read was on one side and the other one on the other side, and then uh, quite a few uh, reads in the genome next to it. So then we looked at this before. We saw in endometrial cancer that the correlation between RNA of line one is uh, highly correlated to the protein. And then we can also see that the protein in endometrial cancer is actually of line one is um, uh, also correlated with uh, the number of novel insertions in that tumor. Um, so, uh, so then the question is, what does uh, this uh, mean? Is, uh, or, I mean, is, uh, is line one uh, driving the tumor or is it uh, just a passenger because there is already a lot of uh, um, damage, uh, uh, I mean, uh, DNA damage. So uh, that's something that we are uh, uh, continuing to investigate and trying to figure out. And we use both uh, genomics and proteomics uh, methods. So um, I'm going to skip these uh, and uh, stop there, I think. And uh, so I hope I've given you a few ideas of what uh, proteogenomics can be used for and uh, a few different strategies, how, what we use for um, integrating. And of course, these are only a, a, a few. Uh, there are many different strategies that people employ. And um, yeah, so any questions? No questions so far. I think I need to digest it again, but it was very interesting. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Me too. We have to, uh, I have to uh, look into some papers you introduced. Uh, thank you for great yeah. lecture. Yeah, yeah. Let me know if you want uh, uh, me to send you any other, um, uh, any other papers or suggestions to read. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And next time we will uh, talk about uh, uh, metabolomics. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.